Testing one, two, three. Happy Friday. How's everybody doing? Better, somebody said? That's good. Or batter, I don't know, maybe it was, maybe it was batter. All right, so um, Friday is here. Uh, we've got some material to cover. We have an exam coming up a week from today. And I'll tell you more about that in here uh, next week. Um, uh, the most common question I get is, will I do a review session? The answer is yes, I will. I will announce that. It's probably going to be Tuesday evening. And um, this is where I usually hear, oh, nobody did that. I, I never know if that's because they can make it or they can't make it. But I usually assume it's because they can't make it. Um, and I will post a. Uh, practice sort of whatever exam. One of the things I will strongly, strongly advise you against is using old exams to study for the exam. Okay? Old exams, material changes from year to year, things emphasize change from year to year, and students waste a lot of time trying to answer questions that many times are not even relevant. Study the material, not old exams. The exam I'm going to give you, I show you so that you understand the format and you see what's being asked. Okay? Really important, and I'll, and I'll get that posted this weekend, OK? We will not work problems off of old exams, because we do not want to encourage you using old exams to study, because it's a bad study habit. I can tell you year in, year out, that's the worst way to study. Study the material, OK? I know it's a really popular student thing to do, but it's also not a good strategy for doing well. OK, uh, well. Um, What do you guys say we start a little bit different today? Start, let's start with a song. How about that? <laughs> Hold on. I had a song. I have a song. All right, song. I got somebody to help us to sing it. All right. The irons up a notch and yank on his studies. The glowing shape will change a bit. Oh, what a sight to see. When we find to oxygen cooperatively. As I exit from the lungs to swim in the bloodstream, metabolizing cells, they all express their needs to me. I get my gift of oxygen and change from R to T. My amines, they hang on to the protons readily. That's not all the tricks I know. There's more that's up my sleeve. Gaps between subunits that hold two, three BPG. When metabolizing cells, I find things that diffuse. The protons and bicarbonates from lowly seeds. Okay, that's enough, that's enough. <laughs> okay, so I bring that up because I've got two songs on the same subject, and I thought that was more relevant as we had just finished the, the, the hemoglobin. So, or we're finishing hemoglobin, we're not quite done yet. So, um, hemoglobin is, of course, the first topic of the day to get finished, and then we're going to start talking about enzymes. Um, by the way, with respect to exam, I will announce where the material will stop. I haven't decided where that will be yet, but I will announce where it will stop, uh, and so you'll know um, all of that. OK, well, last time we covered a lot of material. A couple students pointed out that, wow, you didn't really slow down for questions last time. You seemed like you were on a roll. Okay? And I do like to stop and uh, take questions. So I will uh, perhaps go a little slower today uh, in terms of getting 
uh, things together for you. Last time you remember, we talked when I talked about hemoglobin, I told you the many, some of the many things that it does. And as I uh, said when I finished, I'm not even through yet talking about all the incredible things that hemoglobin uh, does. So the Bohr effect um, is one that you probably gathered was uh, pretty important. I've talked to a couple of students studying for the MCAT, and they said, oh, it always pops up on the MCAT. I said, well, you know, the Bohr effect is kind of an important concept uh, with respect to what's going on in the body. So understanding the Bohr effect is a, is a pretty cool thing. Um, one of the things that, <clears throat> one of the questions that I had from students who came and asked me about the Bohr effect was, well, how does it work? Now, if you recall, I told you several things that we sort of lumped together and talk about the Bohr effect. The first was that when hemoglobin is um, in the presence of um, a lower pH compared to uh, a typical blood pH, so let's say 7.2 versus 7.4, at that 7.2 pH, what it will do is it will release more oxygen than it would if it were at 7.4. So the lower pH will favor the release of oxygen. I also told you that hemoglobin in the presence of carbon dioxide will bind to carbon dioxide, and that too will facilitate the release of oxygen. Well, it turns out that both protons, that is the lower pH, protons and carbon dioxide are products of rapid metabolism. Products of rapid metabolism. So here are some more signals that this cell is making a lot of something. So we've actually got three signals we've talked about so far. One was 2,3-BPG, made by actively metabolizing cells. Protons, made by actively metabolizing cells. And carbon dioxide, all three of which now signal to hemoglobin to let go of oxygen. I told you how 2,3-BPG did that. It bound in the donut. It converted the R state into the T state and locked it into that state as long as it was there. Okay. But now I'm going to tell you about how the protons, uh, and as you'll see, the, the carbon dioxide works. All right. Well, protons, um, no surprise, can bind to uh, side chains that will accept protons. And so accepting protons can change the charge as a result of the binding. And this shows some interactions uh, that happen. Here's a histidine uh, that gains a proton. And when it gains a proton, it gains a positive charge. Well, if it was originally charged zero, which is what it would be before the proton was there, there isn't an attraction between it and this nearby aspartic acid. Zero doesn't attract a minus, for example. But when a proton goes on there, then that proton now is a positive charge, and that positive charge does attract the negative aspartic acid. And so we can imagine that there's now a force pulling these things together, and we can imagine that there's a slight change in shape that occurs in the enzyme, and this slight change in, sh and, and the, not the enzyme, in the protein, this slight change in shape changes the, the way that hemoglobin holds on to oxygen, and that's exactly what happens. So this phenomenon that's going on here, the binding of the proton by the histidine, changes the shape of the enzyme and favors the release of oxygen. So here's a very simple cause effect that's going on with respect to um, the um, uh, release of oxygen in hemoglobin. Okay. Um, another thing that can happen is shown on the screen. And this shows an amine with a proton on it. And this amine with this proton on it can bind to carbon dioxide and release the proton forming a carbamate. And what have we done with respect to charge? We've changed the charge again. Changing the charge can have effects on shape. Effects on shape can affect, of course, the binding of oxygen. And this, too, favors the release of oxygen by hemoglobin. So now we see some very specific structural things that can happen to the hemoglobin molecule and favor the release of oxygen. So all these things come together to mean that hemoglobin is delivering oxygen to the tissues that need it via structural mechanisms. Now these very tiny changes, and I am going to emphasize the tininess of these changes, these very tiny changes in shape will carry through when we talk about enzymes. 
we see that very, very tiny structural changes can have enormous consequences for how enzymes catalyze reactions, if enzymes catalyze reactions, what substrates that enzymes recognize and bind to, that we see a variety of things. And all of these differences that are happening in enzymes and also in hemoglobin are happening because of very, very tiny structural changes. Okay. Now, I told you there's more things about hemoglobin that I haven't talked about, so today I want to finish up talking about some of these. One of them that's very popular, especially among pre-med students, um, is fetal hemoglobin. Turns out fetuses have a slightly different version of hemoglobin than adults do, and that's important. Okay? Imagine you're a fetus, and if you are a fetus, your only source of oxygen is mom. And if the fetus has the same oxygen as, uh, I'm sorry, the same hemoglobin as mom, the fetus is really at a disadvantage because it's not very favorable for one hemoglobin to take the oxygen off of another hemoglobin that's just like it. So if the fetus had the same hemoglobin as mom, then we would expect the fetus would be fairly oxygen deprived. Well, it turns out that fetuses have, as I said, a slightly different uh, type of hemoglobin than mom does. And the slightly different type that they have involves a hemoglobin that has what we call alpha 2 gamma 2. Okay, the adult hemoglobin was alpha 2 beta 2, meaning it had two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. In the fetus, the beta subunits are replaced by gamma subunits. Now, the gamma subunits are very, very much like the beta subunits. We see all these oxygen binding proteins. They all have very similar structures, like we talked about myoglobin, for example. All right? But this difference of the gamma subunits are such that that donut hole that we talked about for the alpha 2, beta 2 adult unit, that that hole is still there in the um, fetal hemoglobin, but it's not big enough to let 2,3-BPG bind. Okay? 2,3-BPG can't bind to the fetal hemoglobin. What did 2,3-BPG do in the adult hemoglobin? It favored the T state, which was favoring the release of oxygen, right? The fetal hemoglobin does not have that 2,3-BPG. The fetal hemoglobin, in addition, has a greater tendency to hold, on to, hem to hold on to oxygen. Now, what that means is that the fetal hemoglobin has a greater affinity for oxygen than mom's hemoglobin has, and the fetal hemoglobin can actually take oxygen away from mom, or from mom's hemoglobin. Okay. As a result of this, the fetus gets sufficient oxygen in order to do its thing. Graphically, we can see uh, it here. All right. As we move to the left on these curves, what we see is a greater binding affinity. So remember that myoglobin was way over here on the left. We see fetal hemoglobin on the left uh, of the uh, mom's hemoglobin uh, line, meaning that the fetal hemoglobin has a greater affinity for the oxygen than does mom's. Now, that's really good for taking it away from mom. But what about the fetal needs for delivering oxygen? If the fetus can't bind 2,3-BPG, a common question I get is, isn't that going to be a problem for the fetus? And it turns out it's not. And the reason it's not is mom has 2,3-BPG, and we have 2,3-BPG as a signal of rapid metabolism. And that's because we have widely varying exercising that we do. We go jogging. It's different than if we're sitting down. The fetus doesn't have that. The only exercise the fetus gets is kicking mom. Okay, And that's not a significant amount of exercise. So the oxygen needs of a fetus are fairly constant. They don't go way up and way down. They don't need the signaling kinds of mechanisms, at least not the 2,3-BPG mechanism, that we have. Okay, so. That's an important consideration, fetal hemoglobin. Questions about that? Yeah? So uh, it switches typically in the first couple of years. So it'll, it'll switch during that time. That was your question. So yeah, it's a common question. What, at what point does the um, uh, fetus start making an adult hemoglobin? It's typically in the first year or two after birth. 
So there'd be a transition time, whoa, a transition time uh, in going from uh, one, um, the fetal hemoglobin to the adult. Yeah? Okay, so the question is, is there ever a time when that transition doesn't occur? And I would never say never. Uh, so there may be some places where that's a problem. But I want to show you uh, an example of where, in some cases, people have used or induced the synthesis of fetal hemoglobin to treat a disease. So I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. But that's where we're inducing it with a drug. Okay. Now, remember that we have DNA that codes for all of these things. So we have DNA that codes for the, the, the alpha subunits, the beta subunits, the gamma subunits. We also have other rarer forms. There's a delta subunit that is sometimes made uh, and so forth. And we're not going to talk about that. All of these genes are called globins. Alpha globin, beta globin, gamma globin. Okay? And gamma globin is not gamma globulin, by the way. So gamma globin. All, right? all of these we have individual genes for. And the, our cells are essentially programmed as a result of the various uh, controls that they have in them to express these genes at certain points. So the fetus, the fetal genes get activated to make the gamma. And then as the fetal genes stop or slow down in the expressing of the gamma, then the adults start taking, adult, adult globins start taking over. OK, well, I said that um, I wanted to talk about it relative to uh, disease. And the disease I want to talk about is one that everybody's heard about, and that's sickle cell anemia. Okay? So sickle cell anemia is a disease that affects the globin genes. And sickle cell anemia is um, uh, actually shown in the very best possible way on this screen right here. What you see in the sort of orangish uh, color there with the rounded uh, structures are normal uh, blood cells that um, um, are making normal versions of hemoglobin. And the sickled blood cell here is making a um, a mutant form of hemoglobin. This comes from an individual who has sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia, first of all, is a genetic disease. It was the first disease that was actually identified as a genetic disease. And I, does anybody know who, who identified it? Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling was the person who identified sickle cell anemia as a genetic disease. It was the first one identified as such. It happens as in the following way. So when a person who has sickle cell anemia um, is just sitting around like you are, their blood cells pretty much look like these guys look like here. So what, hap what causes the sickling? Well, when a person who has sickle cell anemia exercises, the blood cells are dumping their oxygen. And when they dump their oxygen, what's happening is they're in a low oxygen environment. This would typically be in our muscles, where we're exercising heavily and using a lot of oxygen. And those muscles have capillaries, which is where these interactions and this exchange of oxygen is occurring. Under low oxygen concentrations, the hemoglobins within a blood cell start to polymerize. That doesn't happen in a, nor in a normal cell. And this polymerization causes the, hemo uh, causes the uh, blood cell to change its shape. That gives rise to this sickle structure that you see right here. Two things happen as a result of the sickling. One is these pointy things get stuck in the capillaries. When they get stuck in the capillaries, of course, oxygen can't be delivered because new red blood cells can't come in. And so this disease, in some cases, uh, under exercise in certain conditions in certain people, can be fatal. For many people, it's a very painful uh, thing if it's not fatal. Because again, their muscles are just crying for oxygen, and they're not getting what they need. So I said there's two things that happen with the sickling. One is, is they get stuck in the capillaries. And the other is the body recognizes these structures as damaged blood cells. And so what they do, what the body does, is it actually takes them out of circulation, breaks them down, destroys them. Well, consequently, when you start taking out too many red blood cells, or taking out too many blood cells, you don't have enough blood cells. And the result of that is anemia. So which is, this is why we call it sickle cell anemia. And the cause of the anemia is the fact that the body is actually taking these blood cells out of circulation. And it's taking them out, essentially, in many cases, faster than they're being synthesized. So the red blood cell concentration goes down. 
Now, why do I bring this up? Well, I bring this up because um, it's, the sickle cell anemia is an example of a disease that we've learned something about relevant to other diseases. Okay? People wonder, well, you know, if you have a really disadvantaged, disadvantageous gene that's going to kill you, wouldn't that take you out of the population? Wouldn't that gene eventually disappear because people who have it would not reproduce, et cetera, et cetera? All right. Well, it was a very good question, and for a long time, the answer to that question was not known until somebody sat down and looked at the distribution of the incidence of sickle cell anemia compared to the incidence of malaria around the world. And they found that in many cases, these two maps overlaid on top of each other. Look at sub-Saharan Africa here, a lot of malaria, and a lot of sickle cell anemia. And by the way, sickle cell anemia can occur in all uh, cultures, all races, but this was um, an incidence um, a report in, in this section of Africa. There are certain uh, Africans and some Asians who have uh, more of a tendency to have sickle cell anemia. Uh, and anyway, so what was found was that these two overlap, and somebody said, well, there must be some advantage to having this gene for sickle cell anemia. And it turns out that there is. It's not for the people who have the two bad copies of the gene. Remember, we have two copies of every gene that we have because we're diploids, right? For people who are heterozygous, they have one bad copy, one good copy, it appears that youth who have this heterozygous condition survive malaria better than those who are either homozygous for the normal gene or homozygous for the, the uh, uh, mutant gene. So the heterozygous condition actually helps these, uh, pe these uh, people who carry this to survive malaria. And if they survive malaria into their reproductive years, then of course the, the, it gets perpetuated. So it was an interesting observation and it was true. There's actually a fairly complicated reason why it's, it's actually now known to be the case. It does involve oxygen um, and the malarial parasite, but I won't be able to go into it here. Okay, questions about that? Interesting stuff. All right, that is, oh, here's some of the polymerization of the hemoglobin, too. I meant to show you that. This is, these are actually polymers of hemoglobin in, within a sickle cell. So you can actually see those long chains uh, of polymers that arise because of the mutation. Only, when, only in the mutant form do these polymers form. All right, well, we have finished talking about hemoglobin. I want to turn our attention now to talking about enzymes. So hemoglobin has given us a taste of uh, the uh, understanding of the relationship between structure and function. And that's important because with enzymes, we're going to see structure really, really is critical for function. Okay? Enzymes, I like to describe as something that's as close to magic as it gets in biochemistry. It's not magic, of course, but it can seem like magic. I think Steve Jobs one time said that anything that that is truly revolutionary looks like it's magic. Okay. And in some ways, enzymes look like magic. Okay. Enzymes, of course, are catalysts. And we all know from basic chemistry uh, that catalysts are things that speed reactions. Okay. A good chemical catalyst might speed up a reaction 100-fold or 1,000-fold. And this is where we get into the magic now. A really, really good enzyme could speed up a reaction compared to the uncatalyzed form by 140 quadrillion times. That's 140,000 trillion times. And a trillion is a thousand billion. OK? What is it about an enzyme? It's just a catalyst. How come the enzyme is so much more efficient than a chemical catalyst. A chemical catalyst like platinum or something does pretty well, but it's nothing like what the enzyme does. The answer is we shall see, is because enzymes have a property that chemical catalysts don't have. And the property that enzymes have is flexibility. We will see that these slight shape changes that we've talked about allow enzymes to change electronic environments in and around the things they're catalyzing reaction on and achieve remarkable things. 
remarkable things. Okay? Now, not every enzyme works at that rate. Some are as low as almost 10 million. 10 million is pretty good. Okay? So enzymes are remarkable things. Now I'm going to talk about more things in this um, chart uh, when I come back and talk about specific things. But I wanted to bring up this point right up here. Okay? So look at that. 140 quadrillion times. Pretty remarkable thing to get your head around. Enzymes, as we will discover, are specific, or fairly specific, meaning that they will work on one molecule, one structure, or a very narrow range of molecules, all with similar structures. Enzymes don't just catalyze reactions on anything and everything. They're very specific for the things that they catalyze the reactions upon. Okay. The things that enzymes catalyze reactions upon are called substrates. A substrate is something that an enzyme binds to and catalyzes a reaction upon. This might be one thing. This might be two things. This might be three things. But the substrate is the name of the thing that's being bound by the enzyme and the reaction is being catalyzed upon. The part of the enzyme that binds to the substrate has a name as well. It's called the active site. And so the active site is the place on the enzyme that binds the substrate, and it's the place where the reaction is catalyzed. One of the things that happens with an enzyme is that the binding of the substrate by the enzyme actually causes the enzyme to change shape slightly. The binding of the substrate causes the enzyme to change shape slightly. You've already seen this. You didn't think about it at the time, but you did. The way you've seen it was you saw a hemoglobin bound the first oxygen, and subsequent oxygens were more readily bound because the shape, the interactions of those subunits changed, and hemoglobin became more likely to bind other oxygens. Okay? With enzymes, in some cases we'll see multiple subunits like we saw with hemoglobin. But in every case with an enzyme, we're going to see that the binding of the substrate causes a change in structure that facilitates catalysis. Okay? Really important thing. What you see on the screen uh, is a depiction of something we've already talked about. And these were the specificities, the cutting reactions, of a protease. This particular protease was trypsin. And you may remember I said that trypsin cut on the carboxyl side of lysines and arginines. And that's depicted here. If, this, if one of these up here is glutamic acid, for example, trypsin won't touch it. Specificity a limited range of things that it will bind to and catalyze a reaction on. Okay? This is thrombin down here. Okay. Enzymes use something we call cofactors to accomplish what they do. They use cofactors in many cases, not in every case, but in many cases they use cofactors. And cofactors are non-amino acid components that they may contain or use. Well, in hemoglobin, you saw one of these cofactors. It was bound to the enzyme. It was the heme group. Okay? These are various coenzymes. They're called coenzymes in some cases. Coenzymes that the enzyme uses to help it to catalyze reactions. We see that metals are commonly used by enzymes to help in catalysis. Okay? And if you look at the coenzymes, we'll talk about this a little bit later, you'll see that many of the coenzymes are actually things that we call vitamins. Coenzymes are frequently, not always, but frequently vitamins. Needed in small amounts for our body. Our body doesn't make them. We get them from our diet, and that's where they come from. We'll talk about these factors later. No, I'm not asking you to memorize these factors on the screen. How does an enzyme accomplish what it does? Well, if you remember from freshman chemistry, 
the one message that was probably pounded into your head very well was the fact that a catalyst is a substance that speeds a reaction without being changed, right? You put a platinum catalyst in there, you start the reaction, and when you're done, the platinum catalyst is still sitting there. The platinum helped the reaction to occur more rapidly, but it did not, did not get consumed in the process. We started with platinum, we ended with platinum. What we'll see with enzymes is that the enzymes get changed transiently during the catalysis, transiently, but at the end of the catalysis, they go back to their original state. So they cheat. Enzymes cheat. Another thing you learn about catalysis is that catalysis does not change the free energy of a reaction. And again, enzymes cheat. Enzymes do not change the free energy of a reaction because that's a thermodynamic consideration, and the laws of thermodynamic are pretty absolute. Okay? But enzymes cheat, as we will see. Okay? Now, uh, let's review our, our free energy first before I show you um, something about how the enzyme works. We remember that the Gibbs free energy, okay, the change in the Gibbs free energy for a reaction tells us the direction of a reaction. If the Gibbs free energy for a reaction is negative, the reaction proceeds forward as written. If the Gibbs free energy for a reaction is positive, the reaction goes backwards as written. And if the, en the Gibbs free energy for a reaction is zero, the, cha I mean, the, the change in Gibbs free energy for all these, I should be saying, the change in Gibbs free energy for a reaction is zero, then the reaction is at equilibrium. There's a quantity that we talk about that is related to the change in Gibbs free energy, and it's the change in the Gibbs standard free energy. And that's not the same as the change in the Gibbs free energy. The change in the standard Gibbs free energy is something that's characteristic of every reaction. Every reaction has its own standard Gibbs free energy change. If I'm talking about a reaction uh, to uh, break down a protein, it will have associated with it a change in the standard Gibbs free energy, and that will be true for that same reaction as a constant. What does that mean? Well, you've already seen this already. All right? Henderson Hasselbach said pH equals pK plus log of salt over acid, right? What was the constant in that reaction, in that equation? pKa. It was characteristic of a given acid system, right? Wherever we had acetic acid, the pKa was always 4.76, right? The, Gibbs, the change in Gibbs free energy is characteristic of a reaction. Now, not of a, of a, uh, of a, um, a buffer, but of a reaction. If we look at the Gibbs free energy change equation, we see this. And I've written it in simple terms, by the way. The change in Gibbs free energy, which is given by delta G, is equal to the change in the Gibbs standard free energy, that's a constant for a given reaction, plus the gas constant R times the temperature T in Kelvin times the natural log of products over reactants. Okay? That's the part I've simplified. Now I simplify it so that we can think about this in terms that give us some meaning. All right. Compare this to the henderson hasselbach equation, which presumably by now you already know. pH, which is a variable, is equal to a constant plus the log of the concentration of salt over acid. This equation is the same essential equation in terms of structure. It's telling us something different. But the Gibbs free energy change here is a variable is equal to a constant plus RT times a log term that's products over reactants instead of salt over acid. You've already learned how to handle these type of equations. If I have more products than reactants, what's the value of the log equation? Positive or negative? It's positive, right? 
Natural logs obey the same rules that base 10 logs do. If I have a positive value, that means it's more likely to be going backwards. It means the more that the products of a reaction increase, the more likely that the reaction will go backwards because this value gets more and more positive. And look, you know that's the case because you know the change in Gibbs free energy when it's positive makes a reaction go backwards. Now, I'm not going to give a complete lesson on Gibbs free energy here. That's not the point. But the point is to hammer into your head that the Gibbs free energy is a consideration in reactions. We'll talk more about it later when we talk about metabolism. I'm going to bring it up now because I've got to show you something that involves energy. Every reaction involves energy. Every reaction involves energy. This figure right here is one you're going to see next week in your recitations, and I'm going to tell you about it right here. I love this figure. Okay. Now, at first glance, this figure seems a little odd. I'm going to tell you what, you what you see on here. Let's imagine I have a reaction. A goes to B. Right? I like A going to B. All right? A goes to B. And for a reaction to go from A to B, you learn in freshman chemistry that there's an energy hump it has to get over. And once it gets over that hump, then it proceeds to completion, or some reasonable representation of completion. Okay? The change in energy, the change in Gibbs free energy for that reaction, is the difference between the energy of the substrate and the energy of the product. We can see here that the energy of the product is uh, lower. The change in Gibbs free energy is negative. This reaction is favorable. Just because the reaction is favorable doesn't mean that it's going gangbusters. And it's not going gangbusters because it's got this barrier it's got to get over before it makes its way down here. This barrier might be concentration. If things don't if things aren't very concentrated, I've got A, OK? I shouldn't say A going to B, but A plus B going to C. That's probably easier to envision. A and B going to C. If I have just a very tiny amount of A and a very tiny amount of B, the likelihood that they interact and hit each other is low. Maybe when A and B, if I increase the concentration, they're more likely to hit, but perhaps they don't hit in the right way. Instead of hitting like this, where they make a, a bond, they might hit like this. The orientation, just because they hit, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to lead to a, a good product. What enzymes do are two things. They help to increase the effective concentration by binding the two substrates and putting them into close proximity. That's number one. Number two. When they bind these things, they put them into an orientation such that the reaction is going to occur. They, bind, they don't bind them like this. They won't bind like that. They can only bind in one way so that they're oriented properly to make the reaction. Very important considerations for enzymes. Now, what I just told you is that enzymes are favoring the reaction going forward by favoring or reducing the amount of energy it takes to start the reaction. This hump of going from here up to the top is the activation energy. How much energy does it take to get this thing going? The higher that activation energy, the harder it is going to be to get this thing going. The lower the activation energy, the easier it will be to get it going. Enzymes lower the activation energy. Now, that may not have a lot of meaning for you, so I always have an example that I like to use that I'll use here, and I keep bumping that thing. Okay? The example I'd like to give is imagine that we decide as a class that we're going to take a giant ball bearing, about half the size of this room, and we're going to push it towards the Pacific Ocean, right? And make it go into the ocean, make a big splash, right? This giant ball bearing is round. And Corvallis is at about 250 feet above sea level. In theory, we should be able to take this ball bearing, push it out the door, point it west, 
and it goes into the Pacific Ocean. The reality is that won't happen. And the reason it won't happen is because going from Corvallis to the Pacific Ocean is not a nice slow decline where it could just roll down and roll its way into the Pacific Ocean. But in fact, there are energy barriers on the way known as hills. Right? Here's a hill. Well, we're really thinking hard about this, and we think, OK, well, we want to make sure it makes its way to the ocean. We will assume for the moment there are no trees in the way, which if we let things go long enough, that might happen as well. But we assume that there's no trees in the way. So we want to ensure that this thing makes its way to the Pacific Ocean. So we say, ah, I know what we do. We take the ball bearing, and as a class, we push it to the top of Mary's Peak. Because that's the highest peak, and so even if it goes down and up and so forth, it should have enough energy to make it all the way over to the Pacific Ocean. What I've just described to you is this guy. There's Mary's Peak. The enzyme looks at this, and some smart person in the class looks at this and says, hey guys, we're wasting energy. We don't have to go to the top of Mary's Peak to ensure it makes it to the coast. All we have to do is go to the highest pass to make sure that it goes to the coast. And that's what we do. The pass is right here. The enzyme helps the reaction to find the pass. Okay? It's saving energy, and by saving that energy, it makes the reaction favorable. The enzyme has cheated. It has saved that energy from there to there. However, the enzyme cannot violate the rules of thermodynamics. You'll notice that the enzyme catalyzed reaction starts with the substrate energy at the same state as the uncatalyzed reaction. And the product is at the same state as the uncatalyzed reaction. So that the overall change in Gibbs free energy is the same for the uncatalyzed reaction as it is for the catalyzed reaction. Bottom line, all that an enzyme does is it changes the activation energy. It reduces it. And in doing so, it makes that reaction much more favorable. Okay? That's from an energetic perspective how the enzyme works. Okay? Another consideration for enzymes. All right? Enzymes, not surprisingly, okay, because they are governed by all the laws of thermodynamics and so forth. If I had A plus B going to C, I said that reaction was going to be favored by having more A and B so they can bump into each other, and that reaction is going to occur. It tells us that concentration is a consideration for a reaction. In order to understand what's on the screen, I need to define one of our first terms. We'll see several terms with enzymes. And the term is velocity. You have an idea of what velocity is. Velocity means I jump in my car, I go 60 miles an hour to Fred Meyer, and I have run over a few people in the process, <laughs> right? But I have gotten there, and that was the velocity that I had. Velocity was equal to distance divided by time, right? Well, reactions don't run over people. Reactions don't have a distance component. Reactions have a rate of formation of a product. Here I'm going to use A going to B to keep it simple, all right? A going to B is an important consideration. Okay? The more A I have, the more product I'm going to make. Okay? The more A I have, the more product I'm going to make. And if I think about velocity, velocity then is concentration of product divided by time. So for a reaction that we're studying, Velocity is concentration of product over time. Now, if we take an enzyme and we take some substrate and we have, let's say, 20 different tubes, each tube containing the same amount of enzyme and each tube containing varying amounts of product, I'm uh, not product, I'm sorry, substrate. I'm, I'm, my mind isn't working. Okay. Varying amounts of substrate. Okay. And we measure the amount of product over time, we will see this. That is, 
That is, the substrate concentration increases, the velocity increases, and it increases up to a certain point, and then it levels off. Why does it level off? It's rooted in what I just told you. Each reaction has the same amount of enzyme. As I keep increasing the product more and more and more, okay, eventually the enzyme gets completely saturated with substrate, and it reaches the maximum possible velocity it can have. The analogy I give is a factory, and a factory that has a lot of materials to make something has a maximum rate. A car factory produces 300 Oldsmobiles in a day. There's an old car for you. 300 per day, it doesn't matter if I increase the amount of starting materials, the workers can only put out so many per day. The factory has a maximum rate. The enzyme has a maximum rate. The maximum rate for an enzyme will be reached when the enzyme is what we call saturated with substrate. It's a lot of stuff for one day. You guys ready to finish with a song, two songs in one day? Oh, yeah. Okay. I think it's there. What happened? Kind of a slow one. Okay, see you guys on Monday.